life. This uh, message I've entitled, Putting Off the Grave Clothes, Putting Off the Grave Clothes. And, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, all of us, in our sin, before we were born again, were uh, very much alive to sin. When Jesus Christ came into our heart and we got saved, the Bible says we were buried into his death by baptism, not by water baptism, but by placement into. We were placed into his death, and we were buried with him. And because of that, uh, that sin that once was controlling our life is now the power of that's been broken. And so we don't have to live like that. If you find that, you know, pastor, I, I sin and I can't stop. I mean, it's something I, and you find that it's something you even don't feel bad about. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. When Jesus Christ comes into, in, into your heart, uh, he, he makes you different. You're a new creature. Uh, you were placed into his death and you were risen with him, brand new. And so that means you are a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's something definitely to take note of. And you need to reckon that so. Many times Satan deceives us into thinking that we can't overcome the sin in our life. And it's a, it's a mind thing. It's, it's, I don't have the power, I can't do this. I can't, I can't. And uh, Satan is good at making people not doing things. But the Bible says you can. The Bible says you do have the ability to, to live a holy life. In fact, he says, be ye holy for I am holy. And he says, be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Amen? That means we're supposed to analyze our lifestyle and say, is there some area of my life that is not holy before God? And we need to change that. And I understand you'll never become sinlessly perfect. Uh, you know that in your heart uh, there is sin, in your soul, in your body is corrupt and it has desires. But the Lord, because he's in you, has now given you the power to overcome those temptations. And if you know how to strategically deal with those situations, and that's what we want to talk about. And so in Colossians chapter 1, I want to read 11 verses here. And this will make our message today. In verse number one, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on those things above, not on the things on the earth. And so there's our first step. Set your affections on the things that are above. Seek those things which are above. Then it says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. That's a powerful truth that, you know, people say, well, I don't know if you're going to go to heaven. You can't, you can lose yourself. Folks, if I could lose my salvation, how are you going to get it out of his hands? He's the one that has it. <laughs> Amen. The Bible says, no man shall pluck you out of my father's hand. It goes on to say here, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And that's talking about the day of the rapture, the day of resurrection. Verse five, it says, mortify, therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate defection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the, children, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth." Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bound nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Father, I just ask you, Lord, you would just guide me in this message this morning. I pray it would do a good work in our hearts. I pray if someone is here that does not know Christ as Savior, that, Lord, today would be the day of their salvation. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would do a work that man cannot do. Lord, in every one of our hearts, sin has stolen so much victory from our lives, Lord. Help us to overcome. Help us, Lord, to have victory over areas of our life that we have been battling uh, throughout our whole Christian existence. Lord, help us to reckon it so. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we're going to look at this. Uh, we've been looking 
in my last message, I looked at how to live above the world, seeking those things which are above. Set your affections. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. Amen? You got to ask yourself, what's the treasure of your life? And, you know, there's some things you can call a treasure that aren't necessarily bad, but because you put them in place of Christ, they are going to be bad for you. Amen? And so you have to be careful because even though your family, I, I put my family on a very high level in my life, but folks, do you understand something? If I don't love God first, I can never love my family the way I ought to. He's got to have all of my heart. It doesn't say love God with half your heart. It says love him with all of your heart. Amen? All of it. We say, then what, have, what do I have left for my wife? Or what do I have left for my children? Folks, you have nothing of you left for your wife or children, but you have the whole heart of God left for your heart and children. Because when it comes down to it, you're going to love them with a scriptural love. You're going to love them and do what the right thing is for them. Amen? Because if you have half your heart set to them and half your heart set to God, what's going to happen is when you think this half of the heart wants something or wants to do something for them, you're going to do that and bypass the word of God to get it done. Amen? It's all got to filter through the love of God. <laughs> that way I'll do what's right for them no matter what. And most times... Our love for people has nothing to do with loving God or even what's good for them. Our love for people have a lot to do with how we want them to think about us. And when you love God first, what takes place is you're willing to have them hate you or perceive that you hate them because you're doing the right thing for them because they don't understand it. Amen? That's why God's got to have all your heart. <laughs> Seek those things which are above. Set your affections. And your affections, something has your affections this morning. Set it on God. Make him your treasure. Seek after him like a prospector with a pick in his hand and say, let's dig for this. Amen. Instead of digging down, let's dig up. <laughs> let's go up. Let's seek the, the wisdom of God. Let's seek the things of God and have him bless your life and bless your family and bless your grandchildren and your future, you can only be blessed through the things of God. Amen? And the Bible says that he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where are the blessings, God? Where are the blessings? He says, you're looking the wrong direction, son. <laughs> They're in heavenly places. <laughs> That's where you look. Set your heart there. These are the, this is the first thing we need to do. If we can't do that, we're going to fail. If you can't put God first, you're going to fail. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can't overcome this world by your own strength. It's got to be set upon the Lord. It goes on to say, and now we're going to look at this next passage here about mort mortifying. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. When you got saved, you were risen with Christ. That's not, pre that's not future tense. We've looked at that already. That's past tense. I'm already risen. I'm already seated with him. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10, uh, or chapter 6 and 7, it, it, or verse 6 and 7, sorry, chapter 2, 6 and 7. It talks about how I'm already seated with him in the heavenlies. So my position is different. I'm already spiritually resurrected with God. But the Bible says here, mortify therefore your members which are on the earth. Amen? So we know a part of me is with him, and a part of me is down here. And guess what? The part up there doesn't give me any problems. But the part down here does. Amen? You are three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit has been regenerated. If you were a born-again believer, you're seated with him spiritually in the heavens. Your soul is corrupted by sin. Your mind, your will, your emotions, too many of us are emotionally led. We're led by feelings. Pressures come from the outside. We react, and then that's emotionally led. God doesn't want us to be like that. He says, I want you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your soul has to be changed mind first. Amen? And when you get it in your mind, your will, you got to make a choice. And then after that, your emotions say, oh, I guess it's not so bad after all. And they follow. <laughs> Amen? But emotions should never lead your life. 
If you, can, if you can ask yourself, well, why am I making this decision? And the first thing out of your mouth is, well, I feel, back it up, man. Back it up. <laughs> because your feelings ought never to lead your life. Never. We are principally led people. We're led by the principles of the word of God. We're led by the commands of God. And that has to be processed in your mind. You have to make a decision upon it. And then you act upon it. And then your emotions get surprised and say, oh, I thought it was going to be bad. But no, it's been good. So now I got peace. Amen? Because <laughs> emotions are very much led by pressure. And they, whatever you do, Christian, the devil wants you to be an emotionally led person. And if you are you are in big trouble, especially with COVID, <laughs> amen? We're living in a day and age where people are being emotionally led and they're, they're bumping head to head with those that are principally led. Who's right, who's wrong, right? Well, all I know is I just want to follow what God says. That's all, amen? And so there's a new man in you, there's an old man. There's two natures. <laughs> the old nature was born in Adam, in the garden, it was corrupted with sin, passed down from Adam, and all of us became sinners. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The new man was created in Christ Jesus. The Bible says you're a new creature, created in Christ Jesus, and old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen? Amen. So there's two men in you. There's an old man, and there's a new man. And what he's saying here by saying mortify, therefore, your members that are upon the earth, he's saying crucify that old man. That old man is led by emotion. That old man is led by the lusts of the flesh. That old man wants what the world will do for him. That old man wants comfort that the world can give. That old man will not submit to faith. That old man hates to go to church. That old man hates the word of God. That old man loves to sit around and do nothing for God. But he says, crucify him. Mortify him. Amen? Mortify. That's a strong word. <laughs> Murder him <laughs> is what he says. Get him out of your life. He's going to mess you up big time if we don't put him in his place. Amen? There's a battle going on between the new man and the old man. You know, Lazarus, we talked about this last week a little bit. When Lazarus died, Jesus per purposely waited three days before he went to visit the family. They said, Jesus, if you would have been here, you could have healed him before he died. And Jesus just looked at him. <laughs> you don't get this. You're not getting what I'm doing here. He says to Martha and Mary, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He says, if any man believes in me, he will never die. And so he goes to the grave and he says, Lazarus, arise. And sure enough, everybody's, what's going to happen here? <laughs> and guess who starts walking out of that, that grave? Lazarus himself. He did the very voice that brought this world into existence. Jesus Christ is our creator, my friend. By him, all things were created. In heaven and in earth and things under the earth, the Bible says. <laughs> and when he says, Lazarus, arise, Lazarus had no choice but to arise because Jesus Christ is the very son of God, the God that created this world. And you know something? He said the same thing to you. Rise from the dead, thou that sleepest. Awake, he says. Oh, my goodness, friends. Do you understand the same voice that called Lazarus out of the grave has told you to be risen, to, to live that life of being risen with him, to seek those things which are above and to set your heart on the things above? That is the same one that called out someone from the grave and defeated death. And then immediately when he came out, he came out, he was struggling. Because a dead man has grave clothes on. And those grave clothes wrapped around his legs and around his body. And he got up and he started walking. He was risen. You're risen, believer. But many of us have come out of the grave and we're still like this. 
You know what Jesus said? And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. He couldn't even see right. Couldn't see, couldn't speak, couldn't walk right, couldn't move his arms right. You know what Jesus said? Loose him. Yeah. Loose him and let him go. And I tell you today, that's the same thing that Jesus is saying to his people. Yeah. Folks, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. He looks to you and he says, loose him. Let him go. And some of you have gone through things in your life and you, maybe you've been saved and you've got things that are dogging you and things that are holding you back. Those are the grave clothes. And the Lord says, mortify it. Put it to death. Amen? You don't have to have that bondage in your life. <laughs> I'm not telling you you'll never make a mistake. I'm not telling you you will not sin in your life. But what I'm telling you is, if there is something that is tying your hands and your feet, if there is something that is hindering your sight, hindering your ears from hearing the things of God, that God has given the command for you to be loosed. Amen. You notice that some people came to the aid. <laughs> Loose him. <laughs> and he had people that came up to him and said, Lazarus, hey, let me help you here. And they helped unwind the, the clothes off of him and take off those great clothes. You know what? You need the local church. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Oh, I don't need anything. You're proud. And you need God way more than you think. And you think you are far more strong than you are. There's a reason why God called you into a local body. The Bible says that we may exhort one another. We may provoke unto love and to good works. You need that. And I've had so many people try to convince me. Oh, I don't need the church. I don't need this. You're proud. You're saying you don't need something that God said you needed. Oh, Lord, help you. The deception over your eyes, that's a part of your grave clothes. That's a part of the napkin. <laughs> Amen. I realize people have hurt you in the church. <laughs> you may have had a preacher that treated you wrong. <laughs> you don't throw out Christ's purpose and plan for your life over some sinner. We've got to get past it, folks. We've got to do right. Amen we got to wholeheartedly sell out to the plan of God for our life. Go to the Word of God. Let Him tell you what to do because He's trying to peel the grave clothes from your life. Mortify. So He tells you to mortify. That's crucify. Your earthly members. The things that are connected down here. The word mortify means to put to death. To die or to deaden, to deprive of the force and vigor that it has on your life. Deprive it. Amen? I'm going to tell you something. The part of you, the old man or the new man, whichever one you feed the most, that's the one that's going to be stronger in your life. That's why you need the Word of God. That's why you need to read it. You know, in regards to the old man, you know, it's talking about the members upon the earth are relating to your outward being, your body. Your body is a problem because your body is corrupt with sin. And your body is looking to this world for some kind of a comfort or satisfaction. There's a reason why a heroin addict wants to put that needle in their arm. That has nothing to do with the spiritual world. That has to do with the physical there's a physical dependency. Folks, there's a reason why we bring the cigarette to our mouth. Say, well, it just calms me. Well, let me just explain this to you. Nicotine is a stimulant, not a depressant. And the only reason it calms you is because you become addicted to the nicotine. <laughs> and when you become addicted to the nicotine, your body cries out for it. And so when your body cries out for it and you give it to it, it seems like you're being calmed. But in all reality, you're still feeding the addiction. Amen? And I want to tell you something about appetites. You know, the Bible says that Jesus, um, he said 
when he was looking at the pool of Siloam and, the, and the, uh, how they had the Feast of the Tabernacles and they would take the water and they would pour it out, symbolizing the pouring out of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and this is what he told them. He just said, hey, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. See, this is what we want to happen. We want God, who is the source of the fountain, to flow through us and to come out of our bellies. <laughs> bellies? I mean, that's not the way we talk today. We wouldn't say bellies. We wouldn't write the poem and say, out of your belly shall flow. We would kind of laugh and chuckle like you are right now. But the belly, that's the place of your appetite. That's the place of your desire. <laughs> your belly in the scripture always is referring to the things that you desire, or the things that you have an appetite for. And he says, if you will give your life to me, I'm going to have my Holy Spirit flow through you, where even your appetites will reveal the power of God. They'll be under the control of God. Your desires will be under the control of God. <laughs> but we have to mortify. Mortify the members. You know, there's... Um, I've got a couple things I wanted to say. It doesn't have anything to do with the text necessarily, but I wanted you to see these things. Now, do you understand, a lot of people look at churches that have standards, and we say, hey, you ought not do this, you ought not do that, and people don't like that because, number one, we're all rebels, <laughs> amen? We don't want anybody telling us what to do because we're rebellious in our nature because we are from Adam, amen? That's the old grave clothes still on us. And so we don't like being told what to do. But folks, there's a reason why we have standards, because our senses, sight, hearing, uh, speech, all these different things, touch, all these things are portals that can be used to enter into your soul. Amen? They're portals. And so what we do is, as wise believers, we say, if there's something that could enter into my eye portal and affect my heart, and affect my soul, then what I want to do is limit the power of that to accomplish that in my soul. Amen? Now, I realize we live in a time where either you've got people out there that are saying, you do this, and you ask them why, they say, don't, don't ask me why, just do it. Amen? Folks, I'm not like that. I want you to know why we're doing this, because there's a purpose and a plan for the way that we as Christians live our life. David said, I will set no wicked things before my eyes. Yes, Why did he say that? Because he knew that that was a portal. What about hearing? Of course, hearing. That's why the Bible says we ought to sing spiritual songs and not ungodly songs. Amen? Amen. And it talks about faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I want things to enter into my hearing that build my faith and build my Christianity and make me more profitable for God, but don't feed my flesh, my old man, which takes me away from the plan of God. Amen? So there's senses. And now the thing is, these senses and how you use them, touch is another one. Uh, I had a lot of verses. I'm, I'm going to go very fast through this. The Bible says, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Amen? You know why? Why? <laughs> why can't I do this, God? Because touch is a sense. It's a portal. And so God says, don't do that. Now, folks... If you read on, it says this. <laughs> uh, Nevertheless, <clears throat> to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. See, that's God's plan. Yeah. Amen. So anything outside of that dynamic <laughs> is outside of God's standard because he knows that the, that the sensory of touch has the ability to affect your soul and to change you and to hurt you and to take you away from the plan of God, which we don't want. We want you guys to succeed. We want you to live that resurrected life. We want the new man to be strong in you, and we want to kill the old man. Amen? Amen. But I'll tell you something. You got somebody who's just trying to satiate the conscience. I'm going to church just because, well, everybody will think I'm a total heathen if I don't. <laughs> and they hear a preacher preaching like this, oh, what's wrong with that preacher? And they react. The old man is reacting. 
You know what the new man is saying? Amen, preacher. Preach that. Exalt the word of God. Exalt Christ. Exalt his holiness. And you know in your heart, you know, I'm Lord, I'm not worthy. I cannot do this. But at the same time, you say, Lord, that's you. I want you. I want to become like you. Ultimately, folks, if you're born again, you will be like Christ. Amen. Amen. Why don't we get a start on that? (laughs) Why let the old man rule the roost down here? Put him to death. Mortify him. Amen. The appetites. And you know, (laughs) I didn't expect to spend that much time on this. You say, really, preacher? Uh, Yeah, really. You're smarter than I am, really. (laughs) Appetites. You know you're motivated by the things you're hungry for. What do you guys do when you're hungry at home? Where do you go? What if I put up a, a gate at your kitchen and I had the key? And then you're sitting on the couch and your appetite. Oh, peanut butter. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and then you go to your kitchen. A gate? You know what you're going to do? You're not going to go back to the couch. You're going to say, dear, who put this gate here? <laughs> And if the gate's here, who's got the key? (laughs) Because I want to eat something and I'm looking for peanut butter and don't get in my way. You know, your appetites motivate you. They really do. And you know something? There's three types of appetites. The one is a carnal appetite. A carnal appetite doesn't sound as bad as it is because you need to eat food. And you need to have peanut butter. Amen. Amen? Amen? If you don't have peanut butter... Give me a call. I'll send you a jar. I'm very strongly convicted about this. <laughs> Anyways, you know, but you need to eat. And so that's an appetite. Anybody that says, oh, I'm going to be spiritual here and just not eat all the time. Folks, there is the aspect of fasting. That's another message. Amen. But you need to eat. You need to sleep. You know, there's a motivation that you have to go to sleep. Uh, in the marriage uh, in the marriage context, there's an intimacy. That's a need too. That's an appetite. There's all kinds of things that are carnal in this world, but you can't say just stop doing that. <laughs> Amen. In fact, the Bible says not to stop doing those. You need to have those appetites so you can continue on and function. Amen. So those are the type of appetites that you need to be moderate with. You need to control You need to have God's help to control that because you know what? You can sleep too much. My brother told me this last week. Yeah, he says, I remember when you slept and you woke up at seven o'clock the next evening. I says, that never happened. He says, oh yes, it did. More than once. You know, my boys are the same way. I don't know if it's because we we grow tall and we go through a growth spurt. My boys can sleep 14, 15 hours deeply. Not just lying around and, oh, I want to try to sleep. I mean, I'm talking... We got to go to them and shake them. (laughs) Okay, 15 hours, son. (laughs) You know, because with the body as it's being developing, you know, sometimes the body needs more sleep. Amen. And so you got to be cognitive of that when you're raising a family and so forth, but you still got to teach them to get up in the morning. Amen. And so carnal appetites, working. You know, there's a desire in man to actually work. There is. I don't mind that. Uh, Folks, I remember sometimes when I really got working that I I developed such an appetite for it, I didn't want to stop. You know, there came a time where my, where working became a hindrance to the other balances of my life, my family and different things like that, because I would stay there too late. You know why that is? Because when you have an appetite, (laughs) your appetite doesn't decrease when you feed it. Your appetite increases. Now, let me just explain that to you. When I'm hungry, I eat food. You say, oh, I'm not hungry anymore. (laughs) I know, but by the fact that you just ate, you know what that will do? Is continue the process of appetite in your life. So that means that you're going to have an appetite again. And if you eat too much to satisfy your hunger, you'll actually have a stronger appetite the next time. And that's how people get out of balance sometimes with their eating. 
See, when you get the advertisement in Africa, these children are hungry, that may not be the truth. Are they starving? Yes. Are they dying of lack of nutrients? Yes. But do you understand that there comes a point when you starve your appetite long enough that you actually lose the appetite? See, some people think that if I have an appetite, if I feed it, it's going to kill it. No, it just maintains it. <laughs> and sometimes it increases it. If you want to kill an appetite, you have to stop feeding it. That's the way it is with the old man. I remember when I quit smoking, and I quit smoking, tried to quit smoking before I was saved. After I got saved, I took this seriously, because I had Jesus in me now, <laughs> amen. And I realized that it was hindering my relationship with God. It was hindering our fellowship with one another. And that's really what gave me the power to overcome. But what I tried at first was keeping two or three cigarettes you know, on top of the fridge <laughs> and cutting down. <laughs> you know, well, I, you, know, you have people saying all the time, well, I'm just cutting, I'm cutting down. They're all proud. Well, I'm going to tell you something. As long as you keep feeding it, the appetite will still keep growing. Amen. So cutting down, I mean, if it's, if it's a health issue, you're on some kind of a drug thing that if you cut it off, you're going to go into DTs and convulsions. I mean, of course, wean yourself off of that. Uh, but you know something? When it comes down to if you want to overcome something that you want to kill in your life, you have to stop feeding it like that. Stop like that. Say, so, well, I've got a pornography issue. What do you do? Stop it. Well, it's just so hard to go. Take the computer and throw it out the stinking window. Yeah. I'm not against computers. I've got an iPad. I've got a computer at home. But man, if your old man is being fed through your computer and you can't control it, stop it. Yeah. Kill it. Yes, sir. Mortify it. That is the only way to stop the appetite. And don't think for a second if you don't stop it that you won't, that the desire won't stop. It will become less. You will have victory, but you have to obey what God said. Seek those things above. Set your heart in heaven and mortify it. Amen. 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 Mortify it. You know, there's appetites. So there's carnal appetites. There's fleshly appetites. <laughs> Fleshly appetites are those kind of things. Fornication, sinful things. The things that feed your flesh. Not only just bodily things, but they can be soul things. They can be anger and bitterness and things like that. If you keep feeding that, it's going to continue to grow. So what you need to do is if you want to overcome bitterness, mortify it. Amen? How do I do that? Forgiveness is the only way to kill bitterness. So how do you do that? Go to God. Say, God, I forgive this person for doing this to me. And let it go. As long as you hold on to that bitterness, you're going to stay in bondage. Because you're trying to punish them by hurting yourself. Someone says it's like drinking poison, hoping somebody else dies. It doesn't work that way. You're hurting yourself. <laughs> Let God deal with them. Give those people into the hands of God. And by the way, can I tell you something? The way you feel right now, <laughs> the hurt you're going through, the different uh, emotional upheaval that happened in your life because of what somebody did to you is not linked to them. The source of it is you. And can I tell you why that's important? Because if your hurt and pain is linked to them, only two things can happen. Number one, I get into a time machine. I go back and make sure I don't go to the place where that happened. <laughs> so well, that's impossible, absolutely impossible. Number two, <laughs> You change that person to be exactly what you want them to be to somehow satiate your idea or have them punished 
the way that you feel that you want them punished because of what they did to you. And you know what's going to happen after that? You're going to feel the same way. You know why? Because it was never them that caused you the pain. It was how you processed it. You ever wonder how Jesus could take nails into his hand and be beaten, ripped apart, put on a cross, and look those people in the eye and say, Father, forgive them for they know, they know not what they do? Well, say that's God. Well, read Ephesians chapter 4. It says, let all anger, wrath, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. In the same way Jesus said to them, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The Father's looking at you and saying, do that to them. Well, I'm not God. <laughs> no, but you've got a God giving you the power to do it. I'm giving you the ability to mortify the old man. Because you're dead to sin. <sighs> and you're alive to Christ. And he's right in his hands, he's saying, guess what, son? I have your life right here. And I'm looking at your life. It's in a holy place. <sighs> it's protected in my son. It's empowered by my son. It's got everything my son has in it. And you can say, die bitterness, and it will die. The problem is you think that they need to change you first. No. I always tell people, release them. Release those people. The people that you've been holding on to for years and years and years that have caused you so much pain, release them or you will never be free. Or you'll never be free. Release them. And then find out why it is you really feel the way you feel. It's not because of them. It's because you allowed Satan to convince you of something that wasn't true. That's where pain comes from. When I talk to people that have been abused, um, their pain doesn't come from what happened to them. The pain comes from the idea of, it's my fault. The pain comes from, I feel like garbage. Not them. The Lord gave you the ability to be free no matter what anybody has ever done to you. They could walk around you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They could live around your house. And the Lord says, you can be free if you want it. And they don't have to change to make it happen. Yeah. Amen. It's in you. <laughs> That's the graciousness of my God. He's given me the ability to be free in the midst of a bound world. Because I'm risen. <laughs> Amen? So he says, mortify. <laughs> mortify. Put it to death. And I encourage you today, whatever bitterness that is, just put it to death. Put it to death. <laughs> Will they, did they hurt you? Yes. Are they wrong? Yes. Will they pay a price? Probably. But that has nothing to do with your freedom. Do you understand that? <laughs> That's why he says, I will avenge, saith the Lord. Yeah. Avenge not yourselves. Let it go. Release them. God says, the sooner you release them, the sooner I can get to them. And sometimes it's our holding on to it that, that actually hinders God from doing what he needs to do in that person's life. And that's scriptural. <laughs> Amen. Removing the grave clothes. So there's carnal appetites. You need to moderate those. Eat, sleep, work, intimacy, all those things that you need carnally. You're going to need them, but you have to be careful that you don't let them get out of control. Amen. Amen. Fleshly appetites, kill them. <laughs> the only way to kill that appetite is to kill it. Stop feeding it. No more. Today, it's over. I'm done. Say, I've been battling smoking, preacher. Throw those stinking things away. Yeah. 
when this service is done, throw those stinking things away. And yes, the physical nicotine addiction will creep up and say, you need to smoke, you need to smoke. And then you can come up with all the ideas. Well, it soothes me, it soothes me. No, it doesn't. You're feeding your appetite and it's just coming back with a greater vengeance. Kill it. Yeah. Kill it. All those wicked things, kill it. But then can I tell you something? There's also godly appetites. You ever met somebody? I don't like going to church. Why? I don't read my Bible. Why? I don't pray. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. You're feeding the wrong man. I'm going to challenge you. You're battling in church. Well, I battle to come to church. I don't know what it is. I know exactly what it is because it's the same thing that I had to go through. <laughs> Amen. It's the same thing everybody goes through. That means you have to put your body to death, mortify the flesh, but then you also have to say, I'm going to feed my spirit. You know, the appetite won't grow for the word of God until you feed yourself with the word of God. You know, your appetite for church will not grow until you start being faithful to church. If you're expecting it to happen when you're at home sitting there, well, if I wanted to go to church, then I would. Stop being a fool. <laughs> you have to feed it to make it grow. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> well, I don't feel like praying. Well, then pray. <laughs> you know, that's all you can do is just pray. <laughs> Stop right there and pray. Don't think about it. Just pray. Just fall on your knees and start talking to God. And you know what? Next time it won't be so hard to fall on your knees and talk to God. In fact, you may do it every day. And you may say, hey, I like doing this all the time. I'm going to Walmart today. As I'm driving, I'm talking to God because I'm feeding it. And I'm desiring it. And I want it more in my life. Yeah. 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 I mean, get the word of God today in the preaching. Get it in the service tonight. Get it in the service next, in the week. If you're the kind of Christian that says, <laughs> well, they just go to church too much. You're revealing what you are. Yeah. You're a fleshly believer. You're a carnal believer. You believe that somehow we're supposed to find this uh, balance of we just do what we need to do. I am sorry. Jesus Christ did more than he needed to do. He went down Galgotha Road. He took the cross on his back. And then he says to me, deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Enough of this carnal Christianity. You know where that's going? <laughs> Get off of that bandwagon, man. Hop on to the things that God wants you to be and grow. Be what God wants you to be. Amen. Yeah. Oh, Lord, help us. We're a rebellious generation. Churchgoers are rebellious. As soon as a preacher adds another service, <laughs> feed it. Yeah. Feed it. Feed it. Keep feeding it. You want to grow as a godly believer? You want to be a man of God? You want to be a woman of God? It's not going to happen while you're sitting at home on your couch. Yeah. It's going to happen as you say, God, help me. Go to him. Feed that appetite. And I'll tell you something, the more you feed those spiritual appetites, that old man is going to wither in the background. He's going to be crying and complaining, but you're just going to say, shut up. Yeah. I am being blessed here, and I'm not going to let you take it away. Amen? Amen? <laughs> Three appetites. <laughs> what are you going to do? Don't follow this world's idea. Well, if you want an appetite to go away, you just keep feeding and feeding and feeding. No. <laughs> That's what they do. Drug addicts, what do you do? You make them a way to get more drugs. No. In fact, whatever it is that's controlling your life, you need to give that to God. You need to put that to death. Amen? And folks, there are some carnal things that you need. And maybe you've taken things too far. Maybe, guys, you're working too much. And I know what it is, because when a man starts working, it feeds the appetite for work. 
And they just want to work and work and work. And meanwhile, your wife is at home alone. You can't do that. You need your family to be strong. Amen? You need to balance your life. <laughs> be wise with how you do things. Be wise with how you handle your appetites. Amen? Let's bow our heads.